start recording now. So we'll give it till five after one, and then um, and then we'll start. So usually have a few stragglers. So Leslie, is it very smoky in the caribou there? No. No, Kamloops is brutal, but I drove to um, Harrison Hot Springs today. In 30 minutes out, it cleared right up. Hmm. Yeah, it is still smoky here. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's, we've been lucky, like it has blown out every night. Di, are you, you're by Chase, aren't you? My home is, yeah, but the shop is in Kamloops. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's so gross. Yeah, yeah. the kids can't play outside, can't even use the pool. Hmm. Hmm. Is that bad? Yeah, we thought the oh, COVID so is, you know, went to third stage. You know, it's much yeah. relaxed a little bit, but then uh, forest fire, we can't go anywhere. Yeah, yeah, it's real. It's really bad. So, shall we do a quick introduction for everyone, or we do, we skip that? Yeah, we can if you like. Um, yeah, while we're yeah. waiting. Yeah, we might as well wait. So, I, Rob, yeah. you can Rob. You want to go or yeah so die is our presenter caroline's with sanson they're our sponsor i'm michelle i'm the series organizer um patty who's left the screen she is um the uh, executive director for the bc log and timber building industry association um does everyone else want to kind of introduce themselves I pick on people. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can. Okay, okay, I'm Jasmine and I work at OT Timber Frames. Okay. Can you hear me? That's Leslie. <laughs> I met him before. Oh, there's Leslie. <laughs> Sorry. Leslie's on the screen. <laughs> My name is Ernie Beetle and I took the course through James. I see James on there. Oh, hey, you, I'm not too sure how to use this. <laughs> I took the course with James about uh, timber frame construction there uh, a couple of years ago. So, oh, excellent. Good to see you again, James. Good to see you. Yeah, uh, my name is James, and uh, I noticed a few people that I recognize here. Hi, Guy. How are you? Hello. Hi, good. Well, oh, there's John Boys trying to join. Matt, are you, who are you with there? Okay, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, yep. I'm Matt. Uh, I work as a designer at International Timber Frames in Golden. Um, okay. We mainly work with Sanson products. And uh, yeah, I think it'll be interesting for me to have a look here. And I'll probably pass on all the information to our team here. So we can uh, hopefully yeah, improve our finishing department. So yeah, that's why I'm here today. Um, so just a few housekeeping items because we're gonna have a large number of participants today. So um, I'm going to um, do some introductions and then when Di gives his presentation, 
Um, feel free to ask questions, but if there's somebody else talking, um, I think there's like a little hand up thing or you can do a little reaction or even type it into the chat just so we're not talking over each other, but it shouldn't be too bad. Um, so I might as well get started. So Dion is with, um, he's our presenter today. He is the owner of Dyson Joinery out of Kamloops, BC. Um, he's gonna be talking about wood finishing and the maintenance cycle um, and hit products, methods, things that have worked for him and his crew um, and some other suggestions. And this seminar has been generously sponsored by Sansin. Um, it does really go hand in hand and they, a lot of our members do use them. So Caroline has joined us from Sansin and we're just gonna have her say a couple of words and then we'll pass it off to Di. Great. Thank you, Michelle. It is nice to see all of you. Um, it, it brings back fond memories of, of our the last meeting in person in Chase and uh, participating in that uh, contest and w w being part of a winning team, although I, I didn't do too much to uh, add into that win, but it was exciting nevertheless. So, but I do know most of you, but if not, my name's Caroline Marchlong, as she said. Um, I'm Sanson's marketing and sales director. And we're very proud to be sponsors today. Um, we've been uh, uh, worked with Dyson uh, Joinery for, for quite a while. And we've also been a longtime supporter of BCLTBIA and just, of course, support and, and uh, love their mission of, of supporting BC's log home and timber frame construction industry. As many of you know, uh, we are a Canadian manufacturer of wood coatings for log and timber focused on waterborne penetrating finishes for protection and beautifying wood. We offer just about anything you could want for wood from stains, finishes, treatments, and fire retardant finishes in 100 plus colors. So uh, many of you know us, but that's a little ba background. We met Di, I, I didn't have the pleasure of it, but Di came to a Sanson University session, I think, geez, what is it, four, maybe four years ago, and I uh, really, uh, I dove in with the owner of Sanson about wood science, the science behind our waterborne formulas. And, and with all of his endeavors and knowledge of the wood business, he's really been able to apply this um, already to his finely honed skills with wood to uh, produce some of the best looking timber masterpieces we see coming out of BC and beyond. So we're very proud to work with him. And without further ado, I'll turn this over to Di and as he talks about wood finishing and the maintenance cycle. Is that it? <laughs> okay. So yes, um, I'm Di owner. I'm actually seeing quite a bit of people that I never met. So nice to meet you guys. And um, so um, I, I prepared the pre presentation maybe goes for about one hour. So I was wishing that Caroline to take a little more time, but uh, we can leave that to the end for more question and answer and, or some open discussion. So um, Dai then, um, it, like uh, you can see these wood sample boat that I have behind the scenery. I have about a hundred colors in here and uh, then three piece of each. So 300 boat just behind me. So I, because I can hand out whenever the customer comes, I can hand out the one they can take it home. And, uh, but this is my third uh, generation. It, uh, I had this uh, first, first one maybe about three or four years ago. And uh, we had to redo this whole sample again uh, because of the formula change. And uh, then we had to do it again, even, you know, we use a sanction, we found out, like, I mean, after all, we changed that the, the product. So every time we change, or if, uh, if a manufacturer change the formula, it affect the colors. These sample board behind me is all for the color and look, not about the real protection. So it's it's a very important that uh, uh, we keep uh, we have a you know that uh, color under control. Uh, so <clears throat> now these samples I have maybe has been uh, displaying maybe uh, about eight months. I have not been needed to change. And uh, so uh, one of the thing that uh, the message I 
actually have for this seminar is, you know, to work with some um, manufacturer or supplier that has a very solid business, you know, so we know they are here, you know, like uh, I've, I've worked with uh, uh, many different type of product and which I, I still have some car samples around, but I, I can't use it. So, um, so let's start. So I'm gonna talk about a uh, little bit about introduction, why we're doing finishing and uh, you know, why we have to protect wood and uh, some tips that I find, I mean, uh, what we do for our finishing department and uh, some closing review. So um, almost 99% of that our project uh, we send out uh, uh, with a pre-finish, three coats we do. Uh, base coat, second coat, third coat, and sometimes some distress look of the, uh, the project. Uh, we, we need to do a post coat. Oh. Just. So piece like this, maybe it got more than three coats, some of uh, these mark. Uh, maybe not this one. Yeah, it, it does. And some the video I'm gonna show you later. It shows that I I do use some of uh, like a vinegar, I am vinegar type of stuff to make it look old. So, but uh, basically we do a three coat in our shop, and uh, um, ninety nine percent. I should even say hundred percent. Our our project goes with this three coat finish, and um, so and it becoming our strengths. It, uh, our business really, um, um, I, I, oh, most stuff we talk about with a homeowner or that uh, interior designer or, or architect even is about finish. You know, like uh, we don't, uh, there are more important detail that we should discuss, but the, when they come here, they look at a wood, but uh, they, they really stick with this finish and our conversation. Um, basically end with all the finish. They, they take some of uh, the boat back home and then we start to tweak. Um, the amount of sample we go through for one project, it can be anywhere from uh, eight pieces to 30 pieces. And uh, we, we tweak the color because we tint the color in house. And, uh, but uh, so it is very, very, uh, key part of my business is doing a pre-finish in the house. And uh, this isn't a, re uh, this is actually a very easy sell that the architect, contractor, homeowner, they all agree that, that they want us to apply the finish. Um, the, the sun, later on, we talk about uh, the application, what the, the Sanshin uh, recommend to do. It's all horizontal application. You know, like uh, <clears throat> the, the, the wood need to lay it flat. It, you cannot uh, really uh, do effective finish if the if finishing the, those are column, you know, vertical column is hard to penetrate, you know, or leave enough uh, liquid on. So <clears throat> um, it's an additional resource or the, the, you know, the work. I, instead of, uh, I try to engage more, uh, more project, I actually trying to extract more work from one project. So, uh, so that's why we, uh, we focus a little more on a finish. Um, <clears throat> this is at the, just a sample, uh, Western Red Cedar sample uh, test that I did. I left these three pieces on uh, uh, Hawaii Island. And uh, <clears throat> for about one year later, I went to pick it up. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> the basically all the stain failed on this. There are some uh, co very uh, popular uh, oil-based product here called Penafin. And uh, some, I have a bomb in here and some, some stuff that I could just pick up from Home Depot. This was done like after five, six years ago. And, um, Basically, what it is telling me here is that there's no product that can stand, you know, uh, for that kind of a weather. And um, so it's every product we we see in the market, it's just a matter of uh, time when it fail and how it failed. 
So failure uh, mode, like how it fails, uh, more the focus that we, we've been putting and see which product is uh, the, the easiest maintenance. And uh, also this tells me that if we do this sample again, I think I can make a couple piece uh, maybe last longer because of application. You know, at this time we didn't pay much of application that I would, would paying right now. And uh, so we can give probably better bonding performance if we do it now. So uh, it's not only about product, it's also about application. And uh, maybe it's, it's more important that most of the failure that I see uh, in our project and anybody's project, maybe it's application related. It's not about the product. So I have uh, some picture here that, um, you know, like uh, these are uh, the two tables. The both tables are, it's a separate table top that uh, with no finish. And a picture on top shows you that the ones, uh, the both are uh, flat grain. And the one on the left is actually front face of the wood. And the other, then the one on the right is at the uh, back face of the, the wood. We call kiyomote, kiura in Japanese. That uh, this is a very, we always uh, look at uh, the face of the wood to allocate this because of this. So you can see that uh, the front face has not been peeled and uh, on the back face, kiura uh, shows like an onion, it's peeling off. And this had no finish, right? So if you leave the wood uh, uh, exposed without finish, this is what you need to expect. And this other table that we have no finish and these are all vertical grain. So vertical grain do not peel off like, uh, um, you know, those are the back face of uh, um, the wood. So uh, here, this is a deck that uh, it's actually a deck on my house. And you can see the actual deck is gray, weathered, and also uh, the stair and railing, you know, it's all like a weathered look. Uh, but it's actually, it, uh, the deck has no finish. You know, those uh, railing and stair has a finish on it. So at the beginning, it, this deck was, it's a yellow cedar vertical grain and um, I left unfinished. And uh, because I liked that uh, the, the actual touch of the wood, but if this was at the flat grain, you can see what's gonna happen, right? If you, if you end up putting the back side of, of the wood, Kiura, on top, you will start to you know, feel all those sharp edge on your bare foot. So you need to protect. So uh, instead I use a vertical grain, but uh, you know, like, a, so this stair had a stain on it and um, it exposed direct to the sun. It's a south exposure. And it's been, I think it's been over two years now and it's still, you know, at uh, performing really well. And uh, so, the, the water do not uh, penetrating in the wood. I was actually amazed that uh, it's staying really, uh, you know, uh, still protecting the wood really well. So um, in Canada, uh, you know, under uh, my environment, I can, you know, say two years, I can still protect this wood. You know, maybe next year will be a three years. So I'll see how, what's that can happen. Um, <clears throat> so all the wood, um, you know, it, uh, when, when we start to see the color of the wood, like uh, those, uh, we call, what we call uh, patina finish, I mean, patina effect or so on, but it's all about fungus. So that uh, the wood fiber, if you uh, are exposed to the UV, it just, uh, it worked like a bleach. It, uh, it makes the, the wood fiber all white. And what makes it to uh, darker is all these fungus. This, this sample uh, palette is prepared by a sanshin. This was uh, taken out uh, and uh, uh, analyzed from Alan Mackey's house that uh, after he passed away that uh, his daughter took over the house and uh, the one side of the wall, wall were black. And, uh, and because he put the linseed oil 
you know, that uh, I have uh, noticed a couple of projects that, uh, that linseed oil actually kind of becomes a food. And um, maybe it's because I'm boiled or so, but uh, so the, this one type of uh, fungus were growing in his house. And uh, so at, um, it, as a result, there were no solution for this. You know, they had to basically sand it off. And, uh, but the Sanshin does have a lab and uh, the scientists that can extract uh, this fungus and what's in it. And I think that uh, it's a 1998 or so. That was uh, uh, the, the first time I met the Eric, uh, Bo Eric Boz. He stopped by on my yard in Vancouver Island. And uh, I was having quite a challenge shipping product to Japan that I, almost every house gets some sort of a fungus. So he took uh, our shaving back uh, home and he extracted all different fungus in that sample piece. There were, there were some white fungus and so on. So uh, the, there are some, uh, this, uh, the scientific, uh, you know, uh, uh, analyzation is based, it's happening, you know, I mean, we can get support from Sanshin for those. It's only 10 minutes so far. I'm already going through half of it. So the, I'll spend a little bit more time on application. So the surface preparation is, is a quite a key fact for uh, this uh, stain. And um, also, uh, yeah, so surface preparation and application is a key. And uh, I, I think we all understand this, and, uh, but uh, there are some actually surprise I, I'm seeing from the testing. So this is a very simple water drip uh, test that I, I conducted. And um, so I dripped at the, the ink, black ink. Uh, oops. Are we going video first? So I, um, I dropped the four drop of each that the black ink on this uh, different uh, surface and see how it penetrated. And so I have a video and uh, that's where I'm gonna show first. And this video actually screw up some uh, sound system. So just don't uh, bother by the sound. So the first uh, drop test was on the, this hand plane material, which should shed the, the water. And the next sample board is uh, just planar, S4S on a uh, heavy uh, uh, plane. It's not that high speed. Then wire brush, but nylon wire brush. Then we have the steel wire brush. Then rough sawn surface. And then various grid of sanding, 120, 80, 60, and 40 grid is what we, uh, we tested. Then I waited about half an hour. And you can notice 40 grit, 60 grit, 120 grit already saturated, band zone two. And uh, you can see that I'm retesting 80 grit. I'll explain you why later. But after half an hour, <clears throat> you know, hand plane and rotary plane did not penetrate at all. And uh, you know, you won't be even visually uh, um, see how much it, it uh, penetrate in depth. They don't, you know, it, it doesn't go. I, of course, it's, I only have a full drop of it. So nothing I could uh, uh, visually inspect it for that uh, the depth. 
So the more and deeper that it, it penetrates, it, it gives a, a better bonding performance on this. So, so we'll come back to this video again because it's a, it's a pretty uh, uh, interesting that what we're seeing here. Um, So that's a <clears throat> hand plane in in Japan that uh, <clears throat> for the building that do not give a finish that the hand plane is a sort of a part of the finish. If you shave the wood, you know, with, with a super sharp knife, it will shed the water. And uh, my plane wasn't as sharp as it should be. So maybe it gives a little bit of, uh, you know, the penetration, but this electric planer that did not have any penetration. And <clears throat> I know that some people do not sand the surface. They only use a planer as a finish. And uh, it's, it's a real tough to penetrate uh, the finish in. <clears throat> you know, so this is a very important. And uh, <clears throat> then <clears throat> this uh, brush, you know, we do a, uh, this uh, uh, wire brush almost uh, every project if they don't ask. And uh, so nylon brush and steel brush, you see that. Uh, so nylon brush gives more penetration <coughs> and steel doesn't. And uh, going back to this <coughs> rotary planer, it, it, it's seeding the wood, they call mill graze, <coughs> that uh, as those are the rotary head you know, turn, and uh, especially if blade is dull, it creates a heat and uh, <clears throat> you can almost feel by hand. And that heat melts the sugar content in a wood and it grays the wood. So it's seeding the wood, you know? So um, that's what is happening. And that's why that uh, this does not go in. But it was a very light sanding. You can take that mill graze out or you can actually put some, there are some stuff that you can spray on that will take a mill graze out. And this steel wire brush is happening the same thing. It's just overheating, you know? So it only, it, we don't see, you know, it's almost like uh, those uh, rotary plane, right? So it's staying on the surface, it did not penetrate. And um, then we got this, uh, 40 grit and 60 grit. Rougher is better, or, you know, if it, the manufacturer says 80 grit, but 80 grit is kind of a rough for me. I, I like to go 120 at least, but uh, I just did for curiosity the test. Now, what you should pay attention here is that uh, we're seeing uh, the cutter penetrating in this, uh, you know, the, the summer growth but not in winter growth, right? That was the same on the nylon brush, but in, no, this doesn't go in. In, um, in this 80 and 120, actually, and a banso are staining that the winter growth too. It's all the same wood. So I don't know what, why and what's happening. And, um, <clears throat> but, it, as a result, it, it is uh, it's showing uh, better uh, the result. Now, <clears throat> that uh, in the video you saw, I was replacing this 80 grid maybe four four times, and because that uh, in that video it didn't show, I mean this is actually that uh, the result. So, 80 grid is does not look good, right? Uh, they're like a 120 even shows better penetration than 80. And uh, I don't feel that we need to go as rough as 60. And uh, if this is only the test I see, I would say we will go with a 120 grid. And uh, <clears throat> so what happened on this 80 grid after we replace the pieces that because we don't use other grids so often that the actual paper you, we use to, uh, to prepare this uh, um, 
uh, sample piece, test piece, was that the, the paper was new. And because we use 80 grit all the time, the, the paper on the sanding machine was wear out. You know, so um, we, after we switch, so because this, uh, the belt sander, you know, we use it all the time and uh, people trying to save, you know, my crew trying to save not to use too much of this paper. So they, you know, you, uh, you put your hand on, you put your hand on those paper and check, but that you can't really check. If you can feel all those aggregate are gone, it's too late. You are overheating that, you know, seeing that wood fiber again. So, um, I don't know how you do it, but uh, you know, like if you're going to do a sanding, uh, you better just pencil mark the surface so you know where you have gone over and just don't go back and forth, back and forth just by the feel. You need to have a visual, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, judgment, you know. I don't like to use a chalk, but I, I don't mind to put, uh, mark the pencil so you know what part you have gone through consistent speed and uh, you don't go over you know uh, sand so uh, if you sand any of those timber or any surface that you can feel the ditch it's you sand it too much for the finish you know so um, that uh, I, I suggest that you pay some attention on this uh, the belt uh, usage and uh, it's better to replace you know when the time comes and uh, if you're only changing this once a month or so, maybe you're using too much. You're not really sanding, you, you know, with a, the aggregate, you're sanding with a paper, right? So if you can feel the surface, you know, some warmness, I, I think it's already going too much. So that's, that's what I found out from uh, this test. And it's, I think it's a very valuable information. So I, I myself feel fine to go with 120 grit. You know, and uh, because it does, and uh, mind you, that was only for drip of the you know black ink, and uh, in a real uh, application, we the sanction recommend to do, um, you know, like a, a what they call a flat application. So again, it um, we I. I sell, I actually, I don't need to sell the finish, but uh, when I started selling this uh, the pre-finish service, it, uh, it was very simple that says, you know, the, those would need to be finished on horizontal and uh, horizontally. Once it, it's set up and raised, you can only access to exposed side. You cannot stand, you know, behind, inside the joinery and so on. And uh, that the water bomb product or water-based product is a flat application. You need to leave it. You need to leave uh, on a surface until it uh, penetrate in. And uh, the key, key thing on this is a base, the first coat. The first coat need to go in as deep as it, it can. If the first coat do not go that deep. I, I can't really believe the second coat goes deeper. And so we, we have to pay more attention on this first coat. And if the first coat uh, rooted in a wood fiber, then second coat, once you give enough drying time, you're now putting a layer. You know, in, but if you don't wait until this uh, first base coat dried up, the second coat you're putting in, basically migrating to the first coat. You're not putting two coat. So uh, we have to wait until that uh, the, the base coat is at the, uh, uh, cured. But again, it's a damp, uh, it's it related to bonding performance and uh, they want, uh, Sanshin want it to flat, you know, flat on the timber surface and wipe, uh, wipe off after. Now here I have a little bit of a, you know, uh, still challenge that, uh, so the, this brush is a really good brush that uh, this is what Sanshin recommended to us because it holds uh, the stain really well. You know, and uh, you need a lot of uh, uh, holding capacity while you're applying it. Otherwise you, you're going back that tray all the time. But we, 
we are using this microfiber pad. And, um, and uh, I, I had a little chat with our STEM people yesterday too. And uh, in a reality, those brush is, it's hard to control the edge, you know? And uh, if you imagine that uh, you have a brush like this and uh, when you're doing it on top, it's not bad, but when you come to the corner, this, this part of the brush can touch the side. And also those damp application, you know, if flood application, it can run. And uh, that's, that's the main challenge we have. When we have a uh, new people working and um, how we actually see who's good is if anyone can manage to that, uh, the run, run on the side. You know, some people never get it. And usually the man is not good at it. The, the, the ladies are, that's why we only have the ladies in stain department. It, uh, yeah, our guys are not good at doing this at all. And uh, so, but you can see, you know, how sharp and crisp our edge is. And this is why, how we need to do. Otherwise, you know, this corner build up the uh, remaining of stain. And you can see, you know, the, some, uh, some stain stay there and becoming foaming, you know, you can vis visually, you can see, you know, those uh, drips. So, uh, so far we use this, uh, um, you know, micro pad, it works really well, it holds. And uh, we have uh, those uh, squeeze bottle that, uh, you know, on hand uh, and uh, the, those ladies just putting that uh, the stain on this pad and as they go, so they don't have to go back, you know, on a tray and seems working well. But uh, I, after this, I would need to ask Sanshin to come and have a look, uh, you know, that uh, how we, can improve again, you know, because we we want to give a little more on those uh, base code if we can. That uh, I believe that the base code is a key for the performance. So if we go back to that uh, the sample that you know the test I did in Hawaii, that I I, I feel you know more confident that I can do a better job, and because I you know if I pay more attention on this uh, base code, you know it'll, it'll give a better bonding performance. And um, other than that, um, humidity control and temperature control is a key. Um, <clears throat> this may, this is also, you know, um, the, it relate to your performance, uh, the direct result on a coating protection, but a, a much more for actual look of the finish. So the sunshine recommend not to uh, do any staining in a rain, rainy day or you know very dry air uh, direct sun and so on what it happened is if if that uh, the room is too dry it the the stain penetrate into the wood immediately and the where you start you will even see the mark of that pad or brush that big you know, because you had more of the stain at the beginning and uh, it penetrates deeper and uh, it, it shows darker. It, it, it really, uh, you know, do not give you a very consistent look of uh, the finish. So what happened is you actually end up putting less, you know, and less and less. You cannot do those uh, uh, dump finish. Um, so um, if you can, you know, uh, control that the humidity and temperature and uh, humidity is actually pretty a uh, key fact we need to keep it 50 percent so we use that uh, uh, precision coat and uh, we stock two type one for the base coat and the one for the upper you know uh, second and third coat um, the base coat is i believe it's a classic product and the classic product is meant to use uh, greener material or anything even dry wood we actually think classic is better than SDF it, it penetrates deeper and uh, maybe Caroline can answer that later but uh, but the problem with classic is it takes quite a bit time to dry up and so 
Uh, that's why we actually mix. If I, the in the Sanshin website, they say they they don't recommend to put the SDF on top of classic. And, hey, yeah. Hi, can Matt uh, just wanted to ask a question about um, first code applications. Yeah. Go ahead, Matt. Hey, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to ask the question while we were in the subject. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. You, you talked about penetration in the first code. I think it's, it's crucial also. Um, we've been having some uh, challenges about stain quantity on the first code. Sometimes we have some new people coming in and, um, you know, some of them are putting more stain. Some of them are what we call dry brushing, I guess. And I was just wondering... I know the penetration relies a lot on uh, wood preparation, but do you have anything to say about uh, stain quantity? Should we just put more and really saturate the surface in the first place and then maybe do thinner coats in the second and third coat? So you would just do, um, you know, dip your brush and kind of like sweep the excess and go with a moderate amount of stain in the first coat. Yeah, so we are measuring how much we use per, uh, is it five gallon? Uh, for 400 square or 300 square, whatever that it says. I think, is it one gallon? The measuring is a carine or, so you mute it. So uh, anyway, it uh, one, e one either gallon. one gallon or five gallon, the sunshine, some, the classic maybe coverage is 300 or 400 square feet. And uh, we measured our usage and uh, the, at the beginning, it was like 150. I mean, we didn't use even uh, to cover 400 feet, we were using only like a 35%. And uh, then we started to paying a little bit more attention, you know, increase to 50% and uh, 60%, but it's, that's somewhere we're, we're at right now. You know, so uh, the, whatever the measurement we use, one gallon, five gallon, I, sorry, I forgot. We're not using enough according to sanction recommendation. It, it's one gallon is what yeah, we gallon. use for the square footage coverage, yeah. yeah. Yeah, one gallon. I believe that was a 400 square feet or so. So, you know, you budget yourself for the staying cost and you nearly not even spending half of it. You know, feel like you're saving some cost, but it's not doing the job. Yeah, so, we do. Uh, we do about four hundred to five hundred square foot with a gallon. That's the calculation we use uh, usually, and it's been pretty accurate for us. Uh, that would be in a first coat application or in a two coat system, most likely. Yeah, and yeah, um, then you're doing good. Okay. Well, so so you don't have a technique yeah. of like, yeah, just put as much as you can and really saturate oh, yeah. it. It's more That's about what just they being consistent. Recommend. Okay. They, they 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 say you flood that the timber yeah. or the wood <laughs> yeah. with a stain product and wait until it's saturated and go back to wipe it off. But uh, you can do this on some smooth finish, but you can't do this on like a rough zone and so on. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so, uh, but base coat we use is mostly it's a transparent and uh, it's a classic. Mm. So it will penetrate in. So it's, it's, it's a really good idea to pay attention to see how much you are, you know, um, you have soaking that product into the wood. More you can is better it is for performance. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the, the project I visit, you know, for restaining, I, I, you know, admit that quite a bit of those are coming from application. It's not the product. We didn't do proper application surface preparation and so on. So the stair that I showed you, it's two years later, it's still not failing. And that's because properly, you know, uh, surfaced and applied. If we do it right, I think it can stay, you know, last longer. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Go ahead Carolyn. Yeah, just, just a quick comment to Matt and, and to really any of our um, customers or prospective customers is we are happy um, and, and you know really look forward to getting cutoffs or pieces of application. We'll take them in, uh, we'll do our own dry mill uh, test, uh, look at the application and that often 
you know, because even if we come out, we can't do, maybe do that as well in person, but take that information, you know, give some feedback and help refine the application if needed. So I encourage you to avail yourself of that. And that's probably something that, you know, I'll talk to Di about doing. Um, and any, it, you know, of course now it's getting better with COVID, but, you know, any video of application, so you could, you know, make a video of the application, how you're doing it, send in a couple pieces and we can look at that and then use that as a way to refine and just give you comfort in terms of, you know, mill thickness and, and uh, you know, proper penetration, that type of thing. So you're welcome to do that. I encourage you to. Okay. So we use this precision code and um, <clears throat> that uh, I believe that precision code contains a little more solid than a regular one. Um, the regular uh, stain that uh, the sanction sells at the retail store, they don't know that, you know, how the people apply. So, but uh, I think this precision code is more for the people who actually, um, I don't know if uh, Sanshin select the people to sell this or not, but I, it, this isn't the product you can buy from the store, I believe. Correct. Yeah. So, I think I need. I, yeah. As at uh, the Caroline mentioned, um, four four or five years ago, I went to Sanshin University. I, the year before, it was at the uh, uh, International Log Builders AGM at the Banff, and uh, I I asked to sit down with Eric, Eric Boss, and uh, Gary Brown. Gary. Uh, uh, Benjamin Moore in a room, quiet room, and I had uh, so many questions about stain. You know, and uh, <clears throat> it, uh, I couldn't understand how this stain really works and what's in it. You know, and uh, <clears throat> and my, basically my question to them was, how are you preventing the wood to get rot? And uh, what's in this stain is a question I had, and uh, they couldn't answer. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a very fundamental part of other product. So I understood, but I said, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody. But uh, so instead, they put me this in a Sanshin University in Ontario. There are, uh, <clears throat> I, I think, corporate uh, retreat, the log homes. And uh, uh, they, they brought uh, the store people, right? They're educating uh, people from uh, different stores and uh, three days. Uh, and uh, it was good. And, uh, finally, I started to feel like I, I understand a little bit, not, not completely. It's still, I still don't understand. But, uh, uh, you know, they, I, I came back with a confidence that says Sanshi knows what they're doing, basically. Right. And uh, so the following year, I, I, I suggested for association to do some workshop. The work, the sanction agreed to do some workshop uh, at in Chase for you know other people. So I sent uh, two more people from our shop, and uh, so they they went through the same stuff I went through. Um, we do um, color tint in house because we like uh, to control. We're a control freak. You know, we want to control as much as we can, but you know, it's it's a big, big learning curve. You know, now it it this this room looked like a chemical lab, and I really don't know what what these are. You know, it and uh, so um, it's good. It's good to have a control, but uh, there are other way. You know, so after we we're going through all these learning curve. And still is, you know, so far what I am saying is, okay, so we need to penetrate this base code in the wood as much as we can. Then put the color tint, color more on a base code or second code and I put the, you know, clear on top code. Because if we do same color pigment on all three, you start to lose the transparency every time. And you end up like a, that would look like a painted, right? And uh, we learned that by actual sample that we do. So, um, you know, it doesn't look good. So we found, oh, okay. I saw that we, we have a control on this, you know? And uh, 
uh, it may be it's an advantage for us. But if you look at the sanction approach, it's there. You know, the, this is what what it is saying basically. You know, what what I saw we came up with a little you know own approach. It's there already. They they have a classic one, classic two, classic three, and uh, you know the base code is for penetration. And second code is for the color coloring, and third code is for the maintenance. You know, uh, code, and that's what exactly what we're doing here. You know, by having own control, so you don't need to have a own. You know, the control if you follow this. It uh, and uh, these are the really the tweak we're doing in in our shop. You know, which you can just buy, right? One, two, three. Those all have a meaning for it. So if you are doing, you know, uh, pre-stain in a shop, make sure you start from classic one, because that's that's the one made for penetrating deeper. And uh, only the time that we cannot use a top coat as a clear is that when we going after darker color, we need one more coat to do, you know, uh, the color. But uh, for the light coloring, this is good. And uh, make sure you put, uh, we do three coat. You know, that's some of uh, Sanshin website shows two coat, but uh, I we do three coat because we use that third coat as a maintenance coat. That's exactly what the, that was saying. So we're trying to uh, go uh, before the second layer is destroyed or even before, right? So um, I'm getting into conclusion now that uh, um, the project that we get a call that we need to go back and uh, restain or you know, give them a suggestion. And um, these design you see that uh, you know, the, the, the wood sticking out from uh, the roof, right? And uh, it's common and uh, it still is. And you know, seeing how little consideration that people, you know, drawing, designing this, you know, they, and uh, I have not been able to succeed to talk them into not do this. So that's not the approach we can do, but we need to, instead, what we need to do is we need to make sure, we, we need to be aware this part of the wood is going to fail before anywhere else. That, um, all the project I get involved, we talk about uh, uh, stain maintenance, you know, and uh, sort of a two year cycle. In Hawaii, we say one year, even I say two year, the contractor says one year, you know, so I'm happy, you know, I don't care if the uh, sooner is better. But these lights you see is almost the line of where the fade goes, right? The UV effect that where that light, you know, uh, showing and also rain. And some areas, actually, the mist, you know, that uh, there's some place like a, a tropical place, morning mist, you know, it wet the entire ceiling, outside ceiling or wood and so on. But major cause of damage is a UV in where we are. And that's at the, the you know, bad failure. It's my office, you know, so. And uh, so <clears throat> this is a sort of a very common failure that we see that uh, it, it has a, the top film build up. And um, I may not be using sanction on this one. I, I, I'm getting really bad on my memory, but uh, we use that uh, chemical reaction type of uh, finish on this, like, uh, you know, um, the one time we were heavily using baking soda and some ash it and so on, because it gives a really interesting look and feel, but they don't protect wood at all. And we put some top coat on top, you know, those finish. And now we are actually going back. Any project that chose the finish with it, uh, um, uh, chose the finish with, chemical reaction, we are now uh, tweaking our finish to see if we can make that same look with actual stain product. And mm -hmm. we're doing that more and more because it's a little more reliable. We can control the actual color better than relying on chemical reaction. 
So that's happening. So we're kind of uh, start staying away from chemical reaction now, which a couple of years ago we were doing more. Now, once we get to this stage, it's too late. We have to either you know blast all this finish or sand. Sanding is very difficult because it is aged. You know, it's got the groove and so on. So it used to be a that uh, the blast called con con blaster. I had one on the island, you know, so peel off all of this. So basically you're starting over. Mm -hmm. So so there this house I built, I didn't put any finish and two, 20 years later still look good because of the roof. Mm -hmm. So either you put the big overhang roof, so then you don't need to put finish. And uh, or you know you know, protect right. So we uh, we distribute the documentation, I mean, uh, uh, maintenance uh, recommendation and so on. So um, the once you have uh, applied the stain properly and then now the next is at the maintenance, you know, we need to let people know, you know, how we put this in and how we measure, like uh, how we inspect and uh, then, you know, and when to do a maintenance and how we do it. Um, the Sanshin has a program called Sanshin Care that you can register uh, 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 your project and they will look after those, uh, um, remind you when to go after and inspect. For people who does not do any finish, I least recommend to look into uh, do some uh, uh, protection. Uh, there are some good product here that Sanshin has. This is a project that um, we did the finish, you know, complete finish, but we still see the bleed. And this is coming off from the cut, you know, on the field, they, they did this little bit of a, you know, cut. So any new cut need to protect, otherwise this can happen. So, um, we also uh, do recommend them, you know, and we, we provide this uh, NCO, they call it Timber Tech. And uh, I make some jar with a brush in it. So you can, it's available and brush it every, anytime you need. And uh, then there are product called KP-12. So this, I think this is good for six months or eight months. Most of our project looks like they're taking like a three or four months um, to put the roof up, you know, until it protect our timber, it takes about four months. And depends on the area, it can be heavily rain or snow. So because we have a you know complete finish, we're not too worried unless we have some open cut that uh, you know has not been covered. But um, we also have if we see some project, they said sorry, we don't know what finish we want. So then I would recommend to put this KP twelve. And uh, let's see if this zoom in. No, it doesn't. So this KP twelve uh, is is. It repellent the water and they come in KP12, KP12 UVW, UV, UV protection or water protection. And they also have uh, the both added in. And you can see how, you know, the water actually, you know, floating on the surface. And uh, any new, new surface, of course, it'll protect like this. So, uh, but I, I think this would be good for um, what, six months or so. And uh, easy application. I, I believe that the, the commercial people use this. So the cost must be affordable too. I don't, um, this is at the, the, my last page actually. This short on the right. And uh, what amazed me most all the time is that he's wearing a white shirt and no drip on the shirt. I have a couple white shirt and uh, spilled with the coffee all the time. <laughs> you know? yeah, and, uh, you're, I'm amazing. You're, you're absolutely right. I think every time I've seen him with a white shirt, I don't think I've ever seen anything at yeah. all. 
is, that is interesting. Yeah, this brush, that. this brush is uh, holding, you know, so much of uh, stain in it. And when it hit to the corner, you know, then basically I will be covered with uh, the drip. So he would have made a good uh, stainer, you know, if he doesn't own that company. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a very family oriented, you know, people that uh, the Mike was on that picture, sure, and Mike. And uh, they, at, at night, they have a good fireplace, you know, after the dinner, you know, we were talking about, uh, uh, you know, anything, but uh, they, they really uh, took care about the people well. Um, so about Sanshin, it, um, it's a Canadian company, you know, and I don't know any other Canadian company and uh, very reliable. I would, you know, like I, uh, I said at the beginning, I had to change the sample three times. The one time was at the switching manufacturer and second time was, you know, formula change. And I have a 300 piece of material here. And if I have to re replace this again, you know, it's a nightmare. I don't want to do that. So, um, and uh, the 1998 or so on, that's the first time I met them, Eric. And uh, since then I meet him every time when I go to uh, association AGM, they have been always, you know, supporting our industry. And uh, then last, I, I she never did the sales to me. You know, they never told me to support business. And uh, if you have no one, you know, that you're using, I recommend to start with Sanshin. Hey, Guy. Uh -huh. uh, Panabone yeah. asked a question. Oh. oh. And we lost the audio. Michelle did, Michelle, did you want to ask the uh, chat question from, oh, I can. Okay, Panaboat International is asking uh, Dai, once applied, what is your drawing setup in general, but maybe particularly for KP12, if you can comment on that. And maybe dust, I was going to ask you to comment on dust control, um, yeah. if you have any mitigation measures for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have a one person dedicated for uh, dust control. He he cleans up all day, and I'm so impressed and amazed how our floor is clean. You know, and uh, so I I don't know. And uh, plus, we don't do any like a saw cutting in the shop. Yeah. Um, there are a few uh, filter. I mean, the product you can uh, uh, control the dust. And, uh, but it's important if you don't control the dust at the end of the day, those dust will settle on the surface and uh, it feels very rough, you know, so, and uh, we, we vacuum the surface. We don't just brush or blow. We always vacuum the surface. On. Yeah. And uh, for drying time. The SDF, so we use, after we, we give a one day, one full day for drying uh, base coat. And the uh, SDF, we see the four hours is minimum time it need to leave it. But we made it the way, so once we apply in the morning, maybe we just need to flip one more time for the second day, I mean, afternoon. And so two surface a day is what we do. So it takes two days for the, uh, yeah, so, yeah. But you need some space to do that. Four hours minimum. What do you say, Caroline? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's product dependent, but yeah, I would say yes as a minimum. And it's gonna depend on the environment, as you know, in terms of drying time, humidity, temperature. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. you can tell it. The paper should not stick, right? It, uh, so once you, when you check, I, I don't think the hand can tell. Put some paper on it and if it slides really well. Mm -hmm. 
Caroline, John Boyd's here. I've got mm -hmm. a question for you. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good, good. So I, this is related to KB12. It's actually a um, uh, company I'm consulting for in Pennsylvania. Um, Structural Lamb Job, uh, Kinsley. And the KP12, I, I think you had a formula of KP12 that dried quite a bit quicker. Um, and and it's the the pigment distribution is is really uneven on that. And I'm um, and I'm I'm concerned with a formula that dries too fast onto a bare sanded wood um, is going to have a hard time distributing pigment. It's going to be difficult to get that pigment out evenly. Um, are, are you familiar with the project or, or uh, it's called this PSU? Uh, yeah, I, I, I was there actually. Um, yeah. Interestingly enough, they didn't use the fast dry for that project. So oh, they didn't. Oh, I thought they, no, they used didn't. the fast dry. And, yeah. and it, it was, um, I, you know, we get offline. <laughs> I think it was an applicate. It was, uh, you know, they, um, so this is good for, you know, using using rollers or or that type of application is is sometimes challenging, um, uh, in terms of keeping, you know, even application. So uh, there there's definitely some uh, thoughts we had around <clears throat> what might have uh, led to that. But um, that was my understanding was that was not um, that was on spec and that was the, that was the regular UVW. Yep. Okay. I, for some reason, I thought it was a fast drying one. Was what I understood from uh, from Chris Spickler. I, cause, just because I was trying to sort of figure out their approach. What I've recommended to them is leave it for as long as you can and let UV get at it. Because um, we've found that we 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 uh, put a product on a panel that went on a little bit blotchy that was getting shipped over to Moscow. And it sat outside. You know, we took took the top. Sat outside for two weeks and and. Two weeks of sun bleaching sort of evened it out pretty nicely. Um, so it actually looked quite a bit better after some exposure to UV. Um, yeah. I'm not sure why um, uh, that would be, but uh, I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, and that will definitely help. I, I think that I expressed that really well. If the sanding's uneven, variable, and the you know, you're not using a spray or a brush. You're but you're maybe using a roller or a mop on those big panels. I mean, you're gonna, you know, yep. you're gonna see that variation, um, you know, uh, happen, especially if it's, you know, darkened and needs to get back into the light. So that I think are contributing factors. Potentially, um, you've got another product called C20, which which some log builders are using on on logs, and I I've, I've sort of avoided it and used the KP. I, I, I preferred it for the similar application. Can you just comment on the on the properties of the two and why you would use one over the other? Other than I think the C20 is is quite a bit uh, lower cost. But, uh, yeah, so the, the Timber Tech it comes in two versions. Yeah. Um, uh, the differences would be that um, it it also well first of all it has to be removed before you would put on a final finish. Yep. KP twelve is recodable. Uh, it does venture into controlling a blue stain, so there's a bit more, um, especially early on in the you know freshly cut log process, um, and controlling some of those factors. So. Uh, there's sort of a niche or specific market for timber tech where, you know, KP12 bridges over into you still want a biocidal, you know, mold, fungi, uh, protect the wood, but uh, it, it, you like the fact that it, it doesn't have to be removed. It can be, wa you know, maybe lightly washed and it can second or third coat can go on or it can stay as is, especially interior. So it's a uh, sort of weighing what the needs are and what um, the uh, um, you know appetite is for for sanding it before perhaps putting finish coats on so that that yeah that's probably why it's it's builders that I know in Ontario that like the c20 product because they're dealing with white pine which which will blue stain if you look at it sideways um, right. whereas that's not as much of a Certainly not a problem in my yard with semi-desert 
drying too rapidly and UV are the main, main issues in my yard uh, on that. And I found the KP12 UVW um, used appropriately. You know, I mean, it's, if you're going to use it, I, I sort of consider it as a primer uh, that'll protect the timber, but I'm not putting it on, you know, a freshly peeled log that I'm going to store for six months. Um, all I'm doing there is, is uh, waxing the end grain and, and, and then just piling it. Okay, so that's, that's good, Dave. Yeah, because I've never really understood for myself the rational, rationale of C20. I know I've had, at, at uh, a few ILBA and LTBI auctions where you guys have generously donated stuff and we sure appreciate the support that in both associations, but I've come home with C20 and I've never really known what to do with it. So I still have it sitting in my paint locker. Um, with a question mark. Yeah. And, and it is, and it is a constant, it, you can cut it, um, dilute it one to one. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah. uh, for a functional use, it's, uh, pretty, um, uh, you know, uh, does it would be a good, uh, solution to, especially like you said, if you want to control blue stain, a more functional product, it's also good pricing on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. And I, I thank you. I mean, every time I hear you talk on finish, I'm learning something new, which is great. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was, I didn't, I didn't really don't have while, too much to add. He did a wonderful job of, uh, yeah. uh, you know, presenting that. Just fabulous. Mm -hmm. okay. Hang on here, unmute. So, uh, Di, Carolyn, one, once again, uh, great stuff, great information. I actually have been here the whole time, even though I shut my picture up. I have a cold, and I didn't think you guys wanted to hear or see me blowing my nose and coughing and all that good fun stuff, so I just shut my camera up and paid attention that way. Um, in the background, uh, when Di was talking about the uh, workshop seminar that Sanson did, I believe it was four years ago, was it Di, that we did that at conference? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, if uh, if if Sanshin willing to do it again, I think it may help more people. Yeah, actually, and I messaged Carolyn when you started talking about that um, in the background, and and told her it's our twenty fifth uh, anniversary uh, this uh, conference in twenty twenty two, which I think we're going to be holding it the first weekend of March, and suggested that maybe this would be a really good. Uh, pre-conference yeah. uh -huh. um i i believe we did it for three days wasn't it die it was a three-day seminar three or workshop was it two or I three it was two uh, we'll have to get yeah. back in touch two. with short was it two anyways so. um yeah. yeah so we'll we'll take another look at that i think i think it's time to bring it back it was well received before and um uh, I, we've got some new entrants into the, the industry. Uh, we have uh, a lot of our, our members have new people um, in their workforce that are getting more um, uh, interested and need more training. So I really think it's time to bring them back. And, uh, and now because we can gather, touch wood, we're gonna continue to be able to gather in 2022. I think this would be awesome. And, um, and Michelle and I have been talking to the other thing that we're, we're, what we want to toss around is maybe having a chainsaw carving one day as well. And they're, it's going to, they're going to need to put finishes on those. So, you know, this might be something that could be a whole lot of fun. Um, so I, I really want to thank you, Di, for sharing your experience, sharing your um, testing. Uh, it's phenomenal what, what you do with your testing. And I know John does a lot of that as well. I've seen some of his stuff in some of his presentations where he's got all these board, these samples lined up on the roof of, I'm not sure, is that your saw shed where you've got the different pieces up there were all lined up on your that's, that's shed? The where gasket, you tried that's the gasket storage. And we've been testing stains since 1992. And the, right. best, the best stain by far is a big roof overhang. Um, it's, uh, it makes a huge difference. Get it out of the UV, get it out of the weather, be smart with your design, push back against architects that want to expose it to the weather. 
And if not, you've got to manage expectations. You've got to go, you know what, that, that's a maintenance item that you're going to have to maintain every year. You're going to have to completely strip it every five and it will rot out in 20 um, on that if it's exposed, you know, fully exposed to the weather. We've seen that in commercial. Um, in my commercial consulting, 70% of the issues are around finishes and stains. So Sanson's been a, yeah. just been awesome. Uh, with that they've got great products I don't use all their products I don't sometimes don't understand the interaction between them you know I, years ago I didn't like the classic but it's partially because I didn't understand how to use it properly and and dyes really helped open that up to me as has Caroline and and sure they've they've been super helpful so I need to obviously yeah. do some more testing yet it's like uh, we, we sort of try and do it about every four years we'll do a about 50 samples. And we're also looking at, you know, draw knife, circle sawn, sanded, different textures, uh, you know, what's lasting longer, darker, higher pigment levels versus, you know, really clear translucent stains. They just don't last as long, you know, and we're still testing other products, not just Sanson, um, you know, cause I'm looking yeah, for the wait. magic bullet. Haven't found it, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we've got a couple of other questions here. Uh, I believe Ernie had a question. Carolyn's got her hand up and Leslie has a question here. So Ernie, um, let's get you unmuted. Are you unmuted, Ernie? Us to unmute. There you go. Oh, okay. Yeah, to Diane, to Carolyn, uh, if you have a pre-existing timber frame home that's already been named, you don't know what the stain is on it, but you want to strip it and restain. What would you suggest for a product? Or, uh, does Samson um, Samson have a product for stripping existing stains for starters? We do have a wood strip product um, that, that you could yeah, uh, and on Samson.com you can look at. I mean, uh, usually we recommend um, you know just good old fashioned sanding. Of course, depending on and the you know. Sandblasting. I'm not a good expert in that. John is, um, in terms of, um, and he could probably weigh in even better than than I can on that. But we do have a wood strip product. But I do I do tend to see that the sanding or sand uh, or sandblasting tends to end up being the favored route. Um, and unless it's for us, unless it's Sanson on there, I mean there are some situations where uh, we have an ENS product that can go over. Um, other um, waterborne alkyd products if it's in good condition you know that's sort of as a maintenance otherwise not knowing what's on there you'd have to go back to bare wood and uh, reapply. Di have you ever done that where you've actually um, sandblasted existing stains off to get the um, when you're referencing all these different yeah tests? so the easiest is probably wire brush. So you can buy those Makita wheel brush machine for mm -hmm. five, six hundred bucks, nylon brush. Because you know those wood aged is not the flat anymore. So mm -hmm. if you go on a belt sander, I, I don't think you can reach to those groove. Now, when you do that, <clears throat> again, those heat can cause you that the timber surface may be already sealed from UV and so on. So you probably need to gouge out quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, then if you see that uh, the stain is not penetrating in, there are some product to take a middle grade out. So you can spray that. Some condition the wood, then put the stain on top. Right. Yeah, and the wood strip does come with the conditioner like he's mentioning, yeah. just to prep. The, you know, make the, the wood, wood strip is more meant for using those, uh, you know, acrylic <laughs> type of a paint, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're heavy buildup. It softens up uh, so you can scrape that off. Mm -hmm. But the stain, I don't think you need. Thank you. Well, oh, Carolyn, is there a number to call you at if, uh, if we have any other questions about certain product lines? Sure, I can, um, I can, I'll put my email and number in the um, chat for everybody, if that's helpful. Uh, sure would be, yes, thank you very much. Okay, mm -hmm. okay um, so the uh, OT Timber team, uh, Leslie, was that Jasmine? 
I, I can't remember if that, that was the name, sorry. So the OT timber team wanted to know, um, could we get rough cut wood in the demonstrations? So I think that's like moving forward at conference when we're, we're doing things or in future demonstrations with stain. Is that what you're asking for? That we look at some rough yeah. cut? It's just that there's a lot of problems that, well, not necessarily problems, just some different techniques and stuff that we would like to try on, like the the, the rough cut wood, because most of our customers now, are actually, that's what they ask for. Um, and I don't even think Ollie would mind if, if we need some samples or whatever, we could probably bring a couple of samples of, of, of the rough cut wood to actually be able to do. But I just didn't, is that a possibility? Because I know when me and Oliver were in it the four years ago there, it was it was all pretty much planed. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, we're standard. Yeah. No, absolutely. I wrote that down. Uh, we're always, you know, changing up, well, to some extent, you know, the, the, the brush outs and the demos we're doing. So I'll, uh, and that has actually appeared more since, because that's about, geez, I, it's almost three years ago, right? Probably yeah, that. It was a while ago. Yeah. So that has, we have gotten um, rough sawn and, and, and other types of uh, treatments in to demo. Yeah. Well, I would say we also have a couple of different ways we actually finish the rough cut too. We have just the nylon brush and then we are also doing um, a lot of people want that kind of a of an older look and we actually run it through a machine with a wire brush and so it gets that quite deeper um yeah, yeah. that would be great if we could get some from from you rob maybe make a note um and yeah we, we've we've actually thought about that <laughs> actually having some of our customers you know wood on the wall are already yeah. prepped and shown with systems and you're yeah, actually well, the thing is too is only if you have yeah. If you have so many people that are going to be there, you just let us know and we could actually make little sample pieces because I know the last time we were doing it, everybody kind of used the brush and, and, and the different types of stain and stuff. So we would be able to do that. I don't think Oliver would have an issue with it. Okay. A lot of our testing has been on rough sawn. So we are, um, I think like Oli, we found most of our customers actually want a texture. We, we actually have a special saw that does a circle sawn texture and we can also do a bandsaw and texture and or an ads. We've actually found the finishes are lasting significantly longer on the circle saw and texture. Um, and we're not 100% sure why. I, I mean, there's the first reason is it actually takes almost 50% more stain volume um, yeah. on a rough saw and surface because there's a lot oh, yeah. more surface area. Um, but yeah, and the pores are a lot more open. Yep, and you've definitely got to brush it. Uh, you can't do, you can't pat it on spraying and back brushing is, is sort of our optimum there. Um, that, and I think light is reflected in a lot of different directions. It's the UV is not hitting it at just one angle. Um, uh, so it's, you know, we're still not hundred percent sure why our rough sawn samples are lasting significantly longer than, you know, an identical sample on a 80 grit sanded board from the same piece of wood. Um, so it's, it's interesting, but it, uh, we, we like the circle saw and look ourselves. Um, you know, it's a, it's a marketing uh, thing and most of our customers are looking for that. So it, we do warn them though, that it actually, that's, that's the only time we're going to actually be on target for uh, square foot per gallon or even, even under it. Um, yeah. We have the same problem with dye. I can't get 400 square foot with with a gallon I'm usually five or six hundred square foot on a sanded surface with rough sawn I'm down to 300 mm -hmm. uh, 320. yeah I always figure it out and then add another um, yeah. <laughs> add another one <laughs> yeah so it, it's it's 30 percent more more stain on rough sawn than than on a mm -hmm. on a 80 grit sanded surface and there are a whole bunch of factors why I think that happens that's it for me <laughs> yeah, 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 thank you. We'll uh, we'll get back to you on that. Okay, I've got to run. Thanks, guys. That was awesome. Oh, and Matt, Matt just had a quick question about KP twelve for Caroline. But if you have to go, John, that's fine. Me. Oh, if it's a KP twelve question, I, that's that's the product I'm could learn more about I'll hang out <laughs> just day. a quick question we haven't worked a lot with it I was just wondering um I know you guys we can use uh the KP12 as a system with the SDF top coat on it 
And uh, I was just wondering if we're looking for really rich, dark colors um, as, a, as a finish, is that a good system to use? Is a really dark SDF uh, tinted stain going to go well on top of the KP12 or should we just use the SDF as a first coat in that case? Well, there, there's, you have the option of tinting KP12W okay, yeah, um, yeah, okay. or full spectrum. Uh, and then you could go to the SDF top coat. It kind of depends. I mean, what, what, what happens is I'm just more steeped. It, it, so for mass timber or in situations where you want that protective layer. Um, <clears throat> so sometimes I'll opt for KP12 tinted, but you know, SDF tinted and part of that system is great as well. It just kind of oh, depends yeah. on, you know, what's being done in the factory, what's being done in the field and kind of weighing, um, you know, the application uh, strategy, I guess. But to answer quickly, you could get a dark color with KP12. You'd be tinting the KP12W. Okay, yeah, I was asking because I uh, know KP12 to be more uh, exactly like a translucent uh, protective coat. And mm -hmm. I, I wasn't sure if we could actually tint it or not, but okay, thank you for that answer. Yeah. Yep. Um, if there, is there any other questions or Di or Caroline, do you have anything else to add? Um, we're just at the um, hour and a half mark here. So um, I do want to, nothing else to add, Caroline. Okay. No. Di, do you have anything else? Or? No, no, I'm done. Yeah, nice seeing you, James, Rob, Matt, Jill. Uh, Di, thank you so much for your presentation. And Caroline, thank you for your contributions. And thanks everyone for all your questions. It's really nice to have a lot of uh, back and forth. And uh, yeah, Thank I guess you. if that's it, we can close it out. All right. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Well, th right. thank you so much, Carolyn, and we'll be in touch shortly. Um, I think Michelle will be doing the majority of conference work, and I'll be in the background with her. And we're going to uh, we're we've got some really good ideas. So stay tuned for conference as well, you guys. Absolutely. Oh, All right. Years. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for participating. Right. Thanks for now. Have a good weekend, everyone. Bye. Nice to meet you, Jasmine.